just want to do a couple of announcements just for clarification. Uh, in the youth house, uh, we're opening up the youth house every morning at 7 a.m. and we're locking it uh, at dark for you to come by and drop off canned goods, uh, canned goods only. Uh, we don't know how far this uh, virus is going to go, uh, but we do know that if it goes further and the people start to have lost their jobs, need food, we want to be ready to, to at least give some people their food. If you agree with that, say amen, blow by blowing your horn. All right, I think we got it. Um, let me con uh, encourage you to continue contacting people, uh, you know, church people, your family, your neighbor. Uh, and your church family. Uh, Pop Pop called me this week just to encourage me, and Pop Pop, I appreciate that. I don't want to name names, but uh, I do appreciate it. No Wednesday service, so we won't have any Wednesday service this Wednesday unless something takes place, but uh, I will be putting a lesson on YouTube and Facebook out of Revelation chapter 6. Uh, we'll be looking at the scroll judgments. Uh, this uh, service is being recorded, so we will put it on YouTube. Uh, and it will be on Facebook later on for those people that didn't, uh, weren't able to come today. So uh, you can watch it later on or they can. Next Sunday, next Sunday, if we have to do this again, uh, we're going to do the Lord's Supper next Sunday. Uh, if we have to meet in the parking lot, you'll bring your own elements. In other words, bring you a cracker uh, and bring you some juice. And we'll take uh, the Lord's Supper uh, together but we'll do it in our cars. The only thing I got to ask you to do is don't bring something alcoholic in your wine, okay? Uh, that's symbolic of the Lord's body. Don't do that, okay? We won't be checking anybody, of course. If you understand that, say, uh, blow your horn. All right. Uh, the last thing, uh, the carpet, we could not have met today in, in the church, period. The carpet is almost done, but the fellowship hall has been overtaken. The sanctuary isn't quite done. So I see this as a God thing about uh, just us even gathering today, okay? Next week, hopefully, the carpet will be finished. It's going to look great. And if we can meet in there on Resurrection Day Sunday, uh, it's going to be a blowout. So just keep that in your prayers. And the last thing, uh, last announcement, uh, we have a piano. It's an upright piano uh, that's being stored. If you want a piano... You got room for it. It works, probably needs tuning. But if you want a piano or you know somebody that wants it, if you'll text me later on, first person that texts me later on that wants it, I'll meet you down here, but you've got to load it, okay? You got to bring your force with you, all right? Because I, I can't help you on that, all right? Y'all good? Amen? Let's pray. Oh, Father who art in heaven, Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. It is a glorious day that you have given us to gather together. Uh, Lord, what uh, Satan has meant for evil, God, you are turning it to good. We're seeing that all over. The church cannot be stifled. Lord, I pray today for this group that's here today. Lord, I pray that, God, you would encourage them to be the church. We have uh, been going through, Lord, you know in your word and acts that the church is to leave the building. And church, uh, Lord, we know that we're not to be comfortable in just doing what we're doing. Things are changing all around us. So, Lord, I pray that, Lord, more so than ever in the history of our country and in the history of our Christendom and in the history of our personal relationship with you, that, God, we would be, convict us to be the church that has left the building in the way we should. Honor this today, Lord, with your presence. I pray for your Holy Spirit to be present. Lord, if there's someone sick, we pray for them. We know we got people on our heart and minds for their safety. We lift them to you. We lift up our brothers and our sisters in other countries and in other cities and in other states. And Lord, we pray that, Lord, you would put an end to this virus. Give those who have wisdom the wisdom they need. Give us wisdom the wisdom that we need. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said... Come on, Kevin, you're on. All right, I know you brought your hymnals with you. So uh, we're going to sing hymn number 111, How Great Thou Art. I'll try to lead you 
hopefully you're able to roll your windows down so I can hear you and hear it, hear it throughout the parking lot. So let's give this a shot. Uh, 
Uh, I promise you that. But uh, uh, I have learned a lot of lessons. God is teaching me a lot of lessons uh, in this uh, week, uh, in these days. And one of the things is I'm trying not to use the word um, uh, but I just can't get away from the word um. I don't know what all that means, but uh, we just may just have to stay with it. Acts chapter 9 is where we're going this morning. We're looking at the conversion of uh, the great apostle Paul when he was Saul. And the title of my message is The Day the Arrester Got Arrested. The Day the Arrester Got Arrested. Uh, as you're finding your place in, the, in Acts chapter 9, we'll be reading verses 1 through 19. And uh, I got to tell you this in confession. I've been arrested twice. Uh, I have not been convicted either on either times. Uh, one of them came when I was arrested in college. I won't go into detail on that story. Uh, matter of fact, both times was when I was arrested in college. Uh, and one of the things that I'm always reminded when I got arrested, and some of you probably have been there, so you'll be able to relate to this. If you haven't been arrested, well, praise God, glory, hallelujah for you. But uh, the one thing that I got when I got arrested is I got handcuffed. And uh, if you've never been handcuffed, well, you don't want to be because it's a very unpleasant thing because the more you move your arms, the tighter the cuffs get. Well, we're going to look at a message today when God handcuffed Saul who would become Paul. And I'm going to say this to you this morning. When God handcuffs you, he will not let you go. Can I get a witness? I'll, I'll tell you my story about being arrested later, but today we're going to look at the day the arrester got arrested. Reading uh, Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. You don't have to stand unless you can stand in your car. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Let me share with you just a thought coming out of verses 1 and 2, and let me arrest your attention to that first verse, that phrase, those two words, breathing threats. Because I want you to get the picture of where Saul was at that time in his life. The idea behind breathing threats is this. It is the picture of a war horse. Now, hang with me right here. I don't have horses, but I know my son-in-law's got coon dogs, and some of y'all have hunting dogs. The picture here that Paul is going through is that when he breathes in and when he breathes out, all he could think about was murdering Christians. All he could think about, it encompassed his life. When he left the house in the morning, his mind was set on killing a Christian or bringing a Christian into custody. Men or women, it did not matter. That's what the scripture says. The picture here is of a, a horse who has been used to going into battle. And the picture here is a horse as he breathes He's so excited. He can smell blood, and the blood that he smells from the battle is just firing him up. Uh, for those of you that's got hunting dogs, it's like your hunting dog. When he sees you put on your camo, when he sees that you've got your gun, that dog in the pen gets excited. Doesn't he, Wayne? Blow your horn on amen. He knows that the hunt is getting ready to happen. That's the picture that's going on in Paul's mind right there when the scripture says when Luke records that he was breathing threats his life was consumed with killing people like you and I hold on to that thought verse 3 as he journeyed that's Paul Saul he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven then he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him Saul Saul why are you persecuting me and he said, Saul did, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, that Saul, 
later to become Paul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? You need to underline that in your Bible. If you got your Bible today, you need to underline that phrase from Saul to God. What do you want me to do? I believe that every message that you hear, every Bible lesson that you that you hear, every sermon that you hear, at the end of the message, you need to ask yourself that question. Lord, what do you want me to do? Well, here he is. So, God tells him. Jesus tells him. Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. I'm going to add something to that text. They probably had used the bathroom in their pants. That's not recorded in the scripture, but I know Richie Ashburn, that's what would have happened in verse 7 if I was there. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one, because he was blinded. But they led him by the hand, and they brought him to Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple, beginning in verse 10, at Damascus, named Ananias. Uh, Ananias, excuse me. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. You might want to underline that in verse 10. In verse 10, underline that. Here I am, Lord. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah said, Here am I. So the Lord said to me, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. Behold, he is praying. And that's not Judas Iscariot. That's another Judas. And in a vision, he has seen a, name, a man named Ananias coming and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard of for many, from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Sounds like a good Baptist to me, trying to get out of what God wants him to do. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all those uh, who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentile kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, I love this, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Man, y'all need to circle verse 17. The day is now for us to put verse 17 into action. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight. That's Saul. And at once he arose and was baptized. Verse 19. And when he had received food, because he hadn't eaten in three days, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Jesus, we love you. We praise you for, for your word. It is real, it is true, and it is powerful. Today, Lord, you allow us to see the conversion of the greatest missionary that the world, that Christendom has ever seen. We thank you for that. But today, Lord, not only do we want to look at his conversion, we want to look at Ananias. Help us to be like Ananias. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, All right, here we go. If you're taking notes, well, I'm going to go fast. So you may not have a chance to get them all down. Several things I see in the text that come from Saul's conversion. Number one, you will be consciously aware of Jesus. When you are saved, you will be consciously aware of Jesus. Uh, listen, Jesus will make himself known to you when you're saved. Now, I'm not going to go through my testimony, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I had heard people give testimony of Jesus. I had had a, a college youth minister or college minister come to my dorm room and share Jesus with me. But on the day that I got saved, I saw Jesus. I understood Jesus. I understood that I was a sinner and I needed Jesus for salvation. You see, just like Saul, who had was a faithful worshiper of Yahweh, he had persecuted the church, but on that road to Damascus, he became fully aware 
of who God was in Christ Jesus. It was not, it was not a figment of his imagination. It was not some hocus pocus. Jesus became fully in his presence and he became aware of him. In a conversion experience, think about your conversion experience. Did you become fully aware of Jesus Christ? You as a sinner, Jesus as the Savior. If you haven't, my friend, today, today, the gospel of truth goes forth. Jesus is alive. Jesus died for your sins. And He wants to save you. Amen? <laughs> Secondly, you will be deeply convicted of your sin. In verses 4 and 5, Saul could only do what he could do before holy God. He fell on his face. He fell on his face. Uh, the light shone. Now this, uh, in Acts chapter 22 and in Acts chapter 26, we, sh we get the testimony of Paul when he was sharing before uh, the king. And he said that it happened at midday. So you can go into Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26, and you can hear from Paul's mouth his own uh, uh, words from his conversion experience. It happened at midday, and the light shone around him, and he fell on his face. Those other guys didn't see Jesus. They didn't have a clue, but Paul, Saul did. When you come under conviction and God arrests you, you will be convicted of who He is in His righteousness and who you are in your sin. That is the logical salvation process. You can't work your way to salvation. You've got to be convicted by God that you're a sinner. And at that point, you can only do one thing. You can run and blasphemy the Holy Spirit or you fall on your face. And Saul, who later became Paul, did that. Thirdly, not only will you be consciously aware of God, not only will you be deeply convicted of your sin, but third, you will experience a change in your life. Change must come from conversion. That's what conversion means. When Saul repented of his sins, he recognized that he was a sinner. His life became action for God. If your life is not action for God, in other words, if you're living the same old lifestyle that you've always lived in your pre-Jesus days, you're doing the same thing, acting the same way, could your life literally be said that you have been changed? Paul here in verse 6a, he says, So trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? When you get saved, you want to do what God wants you to do. In other words, His agenda becomes your agenda. Amen? Y'all with me? So you will experience change. Fourthly, Y'all don't get used to fast preaching, by the way. I don't, I don't know about these 30-minute uh, sermons, so y'all just hang on, all right? Uh, once all this is over, I'm going to preach an hour and a half or two maybe. But anyway, fourthly, and this is important, you will heed the command of Jesus to go. You will heed the command of Jesus to go. Verse 6b, going through 9, Paul had to do what God wanted him to do. Look at what he says in verse 6b. Then the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. What did Paul do? He didn't linger on the road to Damascus. He didn't ask the other guys with him that were traveling with him, Well, what do y'all think? No, he did what God commanded him to do. And I'm going to say to you to this, Is God commanding you to do something? Now you say, Richie, uh, uh, how do I decipher, determine what God wants me to do? If it doesn't, if what God is telling you to do does not line up with His Word, it may be your flesh telling you what to do instead of what God telling you what to do. Amen? Alright, All right. that was Paul's conversion. That's the morning or the noon day he got arrested. But I want us to focus, with a little bit of time I got left, on Ananias. Because uh, hopefully we've all experienced a conversion experience. Maybe it's not like Paul, uh, but I hope and pray you have. But I'm going to go ahead and say this to you this morning. If you are a born-again believer, you better become an Ananias. Because I believe we are in a time of testing, church. A time of testing. 
this week, I have had, this past week, I have had the opportunity to share the gospel with more people than I have had last week or before. VW Caps. I got to lead a guy to Christ. VW Caps on Highway 80. I hope and pray he's going to David Wilson's church today. This week, when they were working on the carpet, five men, we gathered in the sanctuary, and I had the opportunity to share the gospel with them. They, God brought, amen, that's right, amen. One of the guys was from New York City. He's got family in New York. And then this week, a fellow member and I, we went to cut a guy's grass. We got to share the gospel with him. Can I say something to you today? Listen, the time is right for people to hear the truth. The time is right for the people to hear the truth, and the only true truth is Jesus Christ. So Ananias, here we go. Are y'all ready? You got your Bible? Things that we need to know about Ananias. Number one, God uses obscure saints for His will. God uses obscure saints to do His will. Ananias, and his name means God has been given grace, was used by God. He was an obscure guy. Matter of fact, here and in chapter 22 and in chapter 26 of the book of Acts are the only places his name is mentioned. But you know what he had the opportunity to do? He had the opportunity. Are you ready for this? He had the opportunity to share the good news, to witness to the soon-to-be greatest Christian for Jesus that the world has ever seen. Can you imagine the guy who witnessed to Billy Graham? Do you imagine the guy who witnessed to Billy Sunday? Do you imagine the guy who witnessed to D.L. Moody? Do you imagine the guys that witnessed to David Jeremiah? We may not have a clue who they were, but in the, the accords of God, God knew, and God knows. Ananias was used. You don't have to be famous. You don't have to sit on a podium. You can be from Seal, Alabama and a redneck. Can I get a witness? To share the gospel. So number one, what we need to know about Ananias, he uses obscure saints to do his will. Find that in verse 10. Number two about Ananias, we need to never be afraid to do God's will. We need to never be afraid to do God's will. You and I in this passage of Scripture, me, I'll just say me, Richie Ashburn would not have gone and been welcomed by Saul. I would have been scared to death. I, I don't want, hey, listen, have you ever been in the presence of a murderer? I mean, a guy who was killing people? I haven't. But Ananias, because we don't have anything to fear, went to him. You say, okay, Richie, if we don't have nothing to fear, then why are we meeting out here and not side by side in the church building, loving on each other like we normally do? Well, the Bible also says for us to be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, God has not given me the peace to gather us together and hug on each other and kiss on each other. Because I'll go ahead and tell you, I'm not afraid. But I don't want to lay my head down tonight and know that my daughter who's carrying a baby got sick because of me. Or that my grand, Jenny's mom and dad got sick because of me. We can do things without fear. But we've also got to do things with discernment. Because the Holy Spirit is in us, we must be wise. So just like Ananias, maybe his flesh would have said, don't go. But he heard the voice of God, and God said, go. I think about our missionaries right now all over the world. They've gone because God has commanded them to go. Listen to me this morning. If God is laying it on your heart to go witness or to go do something, and you can confirm it, and you know it's from God, then you need to do it. We're here today because God laid it on my heart to do it. Can I get a witness?
Number three. What can we learn from Ananias? Never be afraid of God's will. We should never be afraid to be a, the obscure can be a witness of God. But thirdly, we never need to underestimate a person who gets saved. Never underestimate a person who has been saved because you don't know what God's will is for their life. God's got a will for all of us. Amen. When I got saved the night that Don Graham preached at Mount Hebron West Baptist Church on April the 6th, 1986, and I received Christ in my heart on April the 8th, 1986, and I prayed to do that, I don't imagine Don Graham would have ever in his wildest imagination thought I would be here today. And that's not pointing glory to myself. That's pointing glory to Jesus. Amen? When you... When you got saved, would you ever thought that you would be sitting in a parking lot worshiping Jesus? Never underestimate your salvation because in God's kingdom, you are important. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, Father who art in heaven, Lord Jesus, we love you. We praise you for this day. Lord, I pray you would speak to the hearts of the people. We love what we've seen and thank you for what you did in Paul. But Lord, we also thank you what you did in Ananias. Your grace is sufficient. And Lord, today we pray for that grace. Unloose our tongues. Unloose our voices to sing praises to you, but also to be ready to give a defense for our faith. Jesus, when you bring people into our presence this upcoming week, some are going to be scared. Some are not going to know their eternal destination. Some are going to be thinking about whether or not hell is waiting for them. Lord, help us to share the good news. Help us to tell people about you. Our world needs it. The United States needs it. Alabama needs it. Russell County needs it. Seal, Alabama, Fort Mitchell, Crawford, Pittsview, Phoenix City, Columbus, Georgia. Listen, Lord, we need to be about telling the gospel. Help us to be the Ananias you would have us to be. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said... Thank <laughs> you.